Hello, lovelies. Well, last week I talked about Thomas Brophy and his galactic maps, his origin map of the entire known and unknown galactic universe. <laughs> what do you call it? The, uh, I don't know, what do you call like maps of various universes within universe? It's not a map of the universe, is it? I don't know what it's called. But anyway, I want to tell you about something else that I found for this talk that I gave. There was some ancient history from way back in the 90s. And this was some of the research by a gentleman by the name of Lloyd Pye. And the points he was trying to make include these. First of all, there really is very, very little archaeological evidence in the first place. Many of the regions on Earth are so hot and goopy, as I know, living in Thailand, that evidence of human remains from, you know, millions of years ago, even thousands of years ago, decomposes. And so it just doesn't exist. And so a lot of these, well, let me step back for a second. The part of Lloyd Pye's research that most intrigues me is the idea of alien intervention on humanity at the level of our DNA. And part of Lloyd Pye's case is that when you take the Darwinist model of evolution, you need to be able to find evolutionary leaps in genetics step by step to come to humanity. So to oversimplify thing, you need a chimpanzee, you need a missing link, and then you need humanity. And Lloyd Pye talks about this search for the missing link, and it's called <laughs> the missing link for a reason, is that the Darwinist scientific community haven't yet found what is a viable missing link of genetics to get us from apes or chimpanzees, which are our closest relative, to humans. And the point that he makes is that researchers get paid to find things. And so if you go out there and you find a skeleton that kind of sort of looks like it could be the missing link. For example, chimpanzees' arms are really, really long and humans' arms aren't that long. And if you find a skeleton where the arms don't look that long and then you actually like push the shoulders up a little bit higher <laughs> so that the arms don't go quite far as long down the body as they would and you take a picture of it and you say, I found the missing link, it's pretty good. You get paid because, you know, it, the arms aren't quite as long as they should be. But the problem is maybe you've only found half a skeleton or maybe you've only found one wonky tooth. And one wonky tooth is like not the chimpanzee tooth and it's not the human tooth, but it's like halfway between those teeth. And wow, that's evidence of a missing link. Well, guess what? I have wonky teeth that look chimp-like myself. I'm not going to say I'm a missing link, but you know what I get the the actual amount of evidence that exists is A, very, very small, and B, a lot of it is manipulated. Very interesting. Like, it's human nature. We get excited. We find a skeleton. We want to be, you know, whoa, we found a skeleton and yada, yada. But that's neither here nor there because that's not what I want to talk about. The alien intervention theory really starts kind of with Sumeria or the Sumerian mythologies because basically the proponents of the idea of alien intervention and genetic engineering of humanity argue that, you know, the Anunnaki, an advanced extraterrestrial civilization with superior tech and knowledge played a role in the development on life on Earth. Not just humans, though. Apparently, they mucked with corn and they domesticated animals and humans. They were supposedly, you know, responsible for creating the whole ecosystem of humanity that allowed humanity to thrive. The proponents of this believe that ancient texts and artifacts and legends from various cultures 
argue and depict even the story of these beings visiting Earth and influencing human development. And they also use the fact that there are similarities between cultures and species across the world that could be explained by shared ancestry or at least a common origin. And they talk about things like certain physical and physiological traits of humans, such as our heightened intelligence and our spirituality, are evidence of extraterrestrial influence because I guess they believe that no other animals on the planet have such intelligence and spirituality. So basically, according to the myth, the Anunnaki had messed up their own planet and they needed gold to combat their global warming. Sounds familiar. And um, they discovered that Earth had these huge, rich gold deposits down in Africa. And so these brothers, Anki and Enlil, got tasked with the job of coming to Earth and to digging up the gold. But when they got here, it was too damn hot and there was no women. So they got the bright idea of, hey, let's make some slaves and some women. Slaves can do the work and the women can entertain us. And supposedly they did this in um, ancient macadamia, (laughs) Macadamia. (laughs) ancient Mesopotamia, modern day Iraq, where they established the city of Eridu, which was believed to be the birthplace of civilization. Now, Enki and Enlil kind of had different ideas about it. Enki was, you know, a humanitarian and Enlil was not and they had a big war and yada 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 that has really nothing to do with the story I'm telling you today but the bottom line is that apparently what they did is they used genetic engineering well at least Enki did the god of wisdom magic and creation trifled with us and as the texts say we shall make Adamu and we shall make Adamu in our own image after our own likeness, says the text, supposedly. I don't know who translated that, but that's the story anyway. Again, it's a story. We don't know. We weren't there. But anyway, the Adamu comes down to us as Adam, and apparently they made slave inferior models of themselves, which is us. We're supposedly inferior models of the Anunnaki. But is it just a myth? So going back to my there is no history, there's only stuff that exists today and somebody needs to make a story about it to make sense of it. What is there today that could support this whole story? And this is where Lord Pi comes in. As I said, Lloyd Pi had this whole thing about the baby skull. Let's go to a place of his research that I personally find a lot more compelling. So Lloyd Pye believes that he has found evidence of genetic intervention and that this genetic intervention was responsible for the development of Homo sapiens, their physical intellectual differences between humans and other primates was evidence of this intervention. Now, one tenant of his, well, there's a few. The first one is we haven't found a missing link. So his story is that if you look at all of the claims of the Darwinian human evolution story, you can only get so far. And that the compelling evidence of chimpanzee to humanity is tenuous at best. All right. So, yeah, I'll agree with that. And then he makes the point that I thought was really interesting when you actually start to think about it, that while animals on mass seem to be adapted to this planet, humans are not. Humans have adaptation problems and wouldn't survive without technology like clothing and fire and housing. So 
Basically, if you break it down, humans have a skin sensitivity problem. (laughs) Humans have relatively thin skin that's easily damaged by the sun, wind and cold and clothing is required to provide protection and insulation from the elements. Now, I know if you're watching TikTok, you're going to see dogs and chickens, for goodness sakes, all dressed up these days. And some look cute and some look stupid, but none of them need these clothes to survive. So humans do, however, as we're probably horribly aware of without our energy in Europe and it's cold and oh, it's just shocking, isn't it? So that's kind of the next point. Poor insulation. Humans have a high surface area to volume ratio. <laughs> Did you know that you had a high volume, high surface area to volume ratio? And this means that we lose heat quickly and have trouble regulating our body temperatures in cold weather. So for that, we need fire and clothing to provide the insulation and warmth. Now, we have a vulnerability to disease. Humans have a weak immune system compared to other animals and even weaker now. Thank you very much. And we're susceptible to many diseases, especially those spread by insects. So fire and clothing can also reduce the risk of disease transmission. Now, humans have a limited ability to hunt, really. We are very good hunters once we make tools like spears and things like that. But naturally, again, without the technology, we're kind of stuck with the gathering portion of it. So tools and technology such as weapons and fire have allowed us to overcome that limitation. And the final one is that we have poor night vision. Humans have poor night vision compared to other animals. And again, fire helps with that. So we're not necessarily born to run wild naked on planet earth in our natural state and then you have that whole issue of the baby thing right so if you look at most animal babies well except for marsupials but you know mammals generally just drop one they wiggle on their legs and they walk off Uh, humans don't do that so there's another kind of comparison between us and other mammals but here's one of the weirdest parts of this story When you're a new species, your DNA tends to be pretty pristine and you tend not to have a lot of mutations because mutations come from being around a long time and shit mutates and then it gets carried down the gene line and then something else mutates. And so when the older a species the more mutations that species should have in its DNA. Now, humans, a relatively young species, carry over 4,000 genetic disorders. 4,000. Now, is that a lot or a little? Well, mm, if you look at chimpanzees that were apparently our predecessor, so have been here a lot longer than humanity, they have around 12. They really haven't done that much research on it, but apparently like it's definitely less than 100. So the species that we came from that's been around a lot longer than us has barely any compared to the number of genetic mutations that we have. That's kind of interesting. And also, if we want to talk about chimpanzees, our nearest relative, there is a lot of similarities, but there's also some significant differences. Physical strength, for example, those little guys are much stronger than us. I don't know if you've seen that horrible thing where the chimp ripped off this girl's face. But I don't know if even Chance could rip off my face. Chance wants to rip off my face sometimes, I can tell you that much. But could he actually do it? I don't know. So chimps are much stronger. They're up to, you know, they say four times stronger 
than humans. And it's because of their greater proportion of muscle mass to body weight. And so they're capable of generating much more force per unit of body weight than humans. They're also much more agile. They have better hand-eye coordination. They can climb much better than us. Obviously, they don't have, what do they say, spirituality or intelligence? Or do they? I don't know, but that's basically the argument, that we've come along and we're a lot more intelligent. So when it comes to the genetic orders of chimpanzees, Again, it's not very documented, right? However, it is known that chimpanzees, like other animal species, have relatively few genetic disorders through their gene pool. Raising from a few dozen to a few hundred, these genetic disorders tend to cause non-fatal afflictions, like albinism. And severe genetic disorders are weeded out over time from the gene pool, as these animals just don't make it. So that's another reason why there's so few, is that if there's a mutation that doesn't allow them to thrive in the wild, that animal dies out and that gene isn't carried on. Humans have 4,000, ranging from mild to severe. But here is where it gets really interesting and a little bit complicated, so bear with me. Humans have a genome that is 97% the same as chimps, but we have two fewer chromosomes than higher primates. Humans carry 23 chromosomes from each parent for a total of 46. So how could we lose two entire chromosomes, which are full of all the data that make us ours? and still become quote-unquote better than chimpanzees. And how do we lose two chromosomes and still have 97% the same genome as chimps? That's kind of interesting, isn't it? And look, they say we also have like 97% the same genome as bananas, right? (laughs) So all of this is just kind of the setup for the really interesting stuff. But the point is that we didn't actually lose those two chromosomes. The second and third chromosomes in primates are in humans fused together to make chromosome number two. All right, so all of us, the humans, the chimps, the gorillas, the orangutan, have very similar chromosome number one. When it comes to chimps, gorillas, and orangutans, they have a chromosome 2 and a chromosome 3. But in humans, those 2 and 3 have been put together to make chromosome 2. And so our chromosome 3 is really chromosome 4 for chimps, and our chromosome 4 is really chromosome 5 for chimps, and so on and so forth. Now, if you believe in mainstream science, and the only way this could have happened is if the mutation occurred in two individuals at the same time, they lived in the same area, found each other, mated, had an offspring that could also propagate the mutation. So that's kind of asking a lot, right? But anyway... First of all, we need to be able to explain how the mutation was not fatal in the first place, (laughs) right? Uh, So how do we do that? Well, mainstreamers insist nature is fully capable of creating such a fusion by means of a mutation called a Robertson translocation. The profoundly mutated primate individual, which is now what, proto-human, I guess, could somehow grow all the way to birth and then onward to reach puberty. After that, they presume it finds an unaffected mate and reproduces, thereby inserting the new fused chromosome into the primate gene pool as a radical mutation that will gradually disperse. Now, in the real world of humans and, let's say, higher primates, (sighs) 
a human higher primate sperm egg combination cannot and never will work. And we know this because no human has ever mated with a higher primate to produce viable offspring. And apparently the Russians tried this in the 50s and 60s and they tried really, really hard (laughs) as they wanted to get extra strength of the um, higher primates into their soldiers. So they tried it and they failed. But wait, there's more. There's also a problem with telomeres and centimeres. Telomeres are something that uh, I'm very interested in because telomeres have to do with aging. And they're the caps that are found at the end of chromosomes that gradually reduce after each cell division, which is essentially aging. Think of them as a long string of beads on a necklace. And after each division of each of the body's trillions of cells, a bead is lost. Now, when all the telomeres have dropped off, the chromosomes stop replicating and the organism they support will die from advanced old age. Nothing can slow the loss of these beads. Now, centimeres are segments of the DNA usually located near a chromosome's middle, and they are critical to successful cell division, which is the continual process of life that has to happen correctly every time, every time, every time, or things go very, very wrong and haywire and chaos results or cancer, right, within the organism. Now, with that in mind, let's try to imagine what would happen if a pair of chromosomes fuse in the way the two primate chromosomes fused to create the missing one in humans. The fusion puts the two central telomeres in the middle where the centromeres should be and the new chromosome has a pair of centromeres where it should only have one and that one should be where the telomeres are. So let me say that again. (laughs) It's much easier if you can actually see it. So, but anyway, basically the telomeres are all fucked up. The centromeres are all fucked up. And this is a serious problem because telomeres perform the stopping function that is entirely inappropriate in the middle of a chromosome that is supposed to be fully functional, right? So you have the off switch in the middle where it shouldn't be. And you have two on switches instead of one. That's not going to be good, right? So even worse, the centimeres are only useful in cell division. So when that occurs, there will be not one, but two places where it is happening, which would soon lead to a badly tangled mess. Clearly, mainstreamers need multiple miracles to make this scenario plausible. And guess what? The exact array of miracles required have been found. Traces of two higher primate telomeres are found in human chromosomes number two between bases 114,455, 823, and 100, I don't know, but they're found, right? Okay. Traces of two higher primate telomeres are found in human chromosomes number two. But they've also found that traces of two telomeres are found in human chromosome number two. And guess what? One of them has been deactivated in some way that doesn't stop the chromosome's normal functioning. One of them has been neutered. With the fused chromosome, only the middle two telomeres are deactivated. (laughs) The one at the top and the one at the bottom have not been altered. So their crucial role in cell divisioning, that dropping beads thing, still continues unhindered. Isn't that amazing? As for leaving the two centromeres, (laughs) so guess what? One of those has been deactivated as well. Crazy. 
the sequential precision of this incredible one in trillions fusion <laughs> forces us to describe it as yet another of the many miracles the mainstream always seems to be blessed with. Isn't that incredible? But wait, there's more. While the fusion miracles torture credulity for anyone except mainstreamers, believe it or not, we find several more in other chromosomes in the human genome. These are called inversions. Now, an inversion can occur when a segment of any chromosome is sliced into top and bottom and then pulled out and inverted and popped back in. It's put back in its original place, but it's flipped in orientation. According to textbooks, inversions are caused normally by ionizing radiation that causes the genetic bonds of the chromosome to temporarily break during which inversions can occur. These are rare, but verifiable. Also consider that any two chromosomes might accidentally become entangled, and the result is brief tearing loose of one segment, and then it inverts and moves back into place. The beauty of this is that every inversion is unique and if passed on, creates a landmark DNA signpost, which cannot be reversed back to normal in future generations that carry it. It also works to disprove Darwin, as we shall see. In theory, while an inversion changes the order of the alleles that comprise chromosomes and genes, the overall makeup of both will remain unharmed as long as every gene temporarily segregated from the chromosome is returned in the process of inversion and reinsertion. Now brace yourself. <laughs> the genome of every human carries nine of these miraculous inversions that are not found in any of the corresponding chimp chromosomes. They are located in 1, 4, 5, 9, 12, 15, 16, 17, and 18 of human chromosomes. According to Darwinian evolutionary gospel, this means that at some point after the proto-humans and chimps split from their supposed common ancestor, the first of the nine inversions occurred, eventually to be followed by eight more. For example, let's assume that the first occurred in chromosome number one at about five million years ago. One of these new proto-humans carrying those fused chromosomes give birth to a child with an inversion not carried by chimps in chromosome number one at five million years ago. That's simple enough. Now, that child must run the gamut of infant and child mortalities to reach maturity. It then finds a mate. Now, unlike the chromosome fusion case, which won't allow offsprings with a partner having a loose chromosome, inversions can be passed on with a partner who lacks it. In each pairing, the offspring will have a one in two chance of inheriting the new inversion. The same will hold true for their offspring if they carry it. So their odds of passing it to any one of their children is 50-50. So now let's do some math. Because what that means is that somehow the individual with the insertion in chromosome 1 produced a line of offspring that passed it down to every descendant member of its species to become part of nearly 7 billion humans alive today. That's huge. Since today we all have an identical inversion, insertion, in our number one chromosome, it means the insertion had to start at some point with a mutation in one of us who somehow bequeathed it to the rest of us. This mutation, whether it did something good for the individual who had it or bad or nothing at all, would, according to Darwinists, create an aberration that mushroomed out into humanity like a nuclear bomb. 
Now hold that thought. For as unlikely as all that is, guess what? The mushroom cloud inversion in probability had to occur in exactly that way for every one of the eight more times that it occurred. That's right. It's a massive improbability to a power of nine. In a few million years, on nine separate occasions, <laughs> proto-humans were born with a new and quite distinct inversion mutation that would then be passed on to every human alive on Earth today. So the odds of that occurring are enormously more than long. They are beyond imagining. With all that said, here is the kicker, the thing that will lay you low if you're not ready for it. Each one had to happen in sequence because if they all occurred together, it wouldn't be evolution, right? If they all occurred at one time, they would have had to be genetic engineering. So the mainstream are like, this happened, this amazing one in a million thing happened, and then whoops, uh, the same thing happened again, and whoops, the same thing happened again, and whoops, nine times. But let's get clear on this, because it's actually kind of wilder when you think about it. Inversion one occurred, and the genetic line of all other proto-humans had to die out. Only its progeny would live to pass the inversion along to subsequent generations because if it didn't, we all wouldn't have this. So now let's say that at 4.5 million years ago, the inversion in chromosome 4 occurred. And of course, that one had to occur in one of the progeny in whom the first inversion occurred or it wouldn't carry down one and now four through history. Now only its progeny Carrying inversions in chromosome 1 and 4 could move forward into the future. All other proto-human lines at 4.5 million years ago had to die out in another way. If the mainstream is right and the nine randomly generated inversions occurred in a Darwinian sequence of gradually accumulating mutations, it couldn't happen any other way. However, there is another way, as I mentioned genetic engineering. Really nothing supports the intervention theory and the idea of intergalactic terraformers quite as strongly as this fascinating genetic difference between our human DNA and chimp DNA and actually gorilla DNA and since recent discovery, Neanderthal DNA. And as it happens, the Bible told us so. The Bible said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and just exchange the word man for Adamu and it's a direct lift apparently so, I don't know, I don't speak Sumerian, but from the text written 2,000 years before it. So is it possible? Can we humans be aliens living on earth created by Anunnaki? I don't know. But it sure is an interesting story. More soon, lovelies. Thank you for listening, lovelies. And if you like this podcast and would like to support us, please go to MagicalEgypt.com. And I have made a special discount coupon just for you all. And the coupon code is LOVE. And that will get you $30 off any Magical Egypt purchase. Also, um, I've started a Patreon. So you can mosey on over there and uh, see if you want to contribute. But I appreciate you listening and I appreciate all your support. And more soon.
Thank you.